Sometime in late winter or, or early spring, the church begins its own season of Lent. Now, the word Lent actually comes from the Anglo-Saxon word for spring. It refers to the time when days are getting longer or lengthening. The word Lent actually is related to the word length. So it simply refers initially to spring, but in a church context, it's something a little bit different. It's a period of time prior to Easter when people in the church, when Christian believers were expected to take time to prepare themselves to commemorate Jesus' suffering, his death, his, and then his resurrection. Uh, Lent ends on Easter at the time when we celebrate Jesus' triumph over death. But the period before that, uh, historically described as a period of 40 days, was set aside specifically to help people prepare their hearts, to examine their consciences, to repent, to be ready really to celebrate Christ's victory over death the way it should be celebrated. Now, historically, the origins of Lent are a little bit murky. Some of the church fathers, like St. Jerome, Gregory the Great, a few others, claimed that it had apostolic origins. But the evidence for that is really rather slim. We don't really see references to Lent or a period of that sort much prior really to the Council of Nicaea in 325. Nicaea talked about a period of 40 days prior to Easter when people would fast and, repent and engage in penance, uh, which in that period was really something that was done very publicly. Now, what isn't clear about that is whether that was referring to everyone in the church or simply to the catechumens, the people who were getting ready to be admitted into the church on Easter. Traditionally, uh, it was not an easy thing to join the church. There was a period of instruction that you had to go through, and there was this period of fasting, of uh, repentance, public penance, and things like that, that you would, would go through in preparation to being baptized into the church, which traditionally, again, was done on Easter. So, the Council of Nicaea's reference to the 40 days before Easter probably refers more to the catechumens than to the general church, but this practice nonetheless spread, and it became something that the, the church decided was a good thing for all Christians to do, to take the time to recognize our responsibility for Jesus' death, our guilt, uh, to repent, to turn away from the sins that have been in our life, and to turn toward the good. So that is the origin. But why 40? Why 40 days? Well, 40 is an important number in the Bible, but specifically in this case, it refers to the 40 days that Jesus spent fasting in the wilderness. Um, after Jesus was baptized, he goes into the wilderness. He fasts for 40 days in preparation for his ministry. So in imitation of Christ, the church decided a fast of 40 days would be the best thing to do. This is the, the appropriate number. This is the appropriate length of time that we should spend uh, in uh, mourning, in self-reflection, in repentance for our sins, all of those kinds of things. But the problem was that the church had already established that fasting on Sunday was inappropriate because Sunday was the day that the resurrection was celebrated. And so they, in the West at least, they took the 40 days before Easter but, but exempted Sundays. You didn't have to fast on Sunday. Now the problem with that was you ended up with a shorter fast. You didn't actually fast for the full 40 days. The Eastern churches insisted that it needed to be a full 40 days. So the Catholic Church added a little bit of extra time. The Latin Church, the Western Church, added a little extra time. And so Lent would then begin on Ash Wednesday. And if you do the count, you'll see that it's actually 46 days. But that's because there are six days in there that are Sundays that are not fast days. Different people calculate it different ways. But that is historically pretty much why it is set up the way it is. Now, Ash Wednesday itself, let's pause for a second and look at that. Uh, Ash Wednesday is a day when Catholics and some Protestant traditions will go to church uh, 
to receive ashes on their forehead in the shape of a cross. Uh, the ashes are traditionally made from the palms from the previous year's Palm Sunday that, that would then be burned. And a cross will be placed on your forehead with the words, Remember man, you are dust, and unto dust you shall return. The symbolism here is twofold. First of all, with that proclamation, remember that you are dust, and to dust you will return, we're reminded of our death. And this is particularly appropriate as we're going into Lent, because what we're we're looking at is, well, first of all, time of preparation for our death, a time of repentance, all of the things that we need to do to get ourselves right with God. But also, Lent ends with the resurrection. It ends with Jesus' triumph over death. So it begins with a reminder of our death, but it ends with the celebration of the resurrection of Christ, which is our resurrection. We are raised with Christ. The other reason why ashes are particularly appropriate is because of the practice of mourning. People will, or, or repentance, people re will repent in sackcloth and ashes. Uh, ashes were used as a symbol of mourning throughout the ancient world. And so it ties in with this theme of, of penance, repentance, and, uh, and preparing for, um, for the commemoration of Jesus' death and ultimately his resurrection. Now, that's the practice in the Western Church. The Eastern Church is a little more complicated. Uh, the Lenten period formally begins on the Monday prior to the seventh Sunday, excuse me, the Monday after the seventh Sunday before Easter. And in the Eastern Orthodox Church, the fast does include Sundays as well. Now, if you do the math there, what you'll find is that the Lenten period ends on what is known as Lazarus Saturday. Lazarus Saturday commemorates the day Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. So, it doesn't go all the way to Easter. However, you have the Lenten fast. This is followed by Lazarus Saturday, which is a fast day followed by Palm Sunday, which is a fast day, followed by Holy Week, which are fast days, ending on Holy Saturday with the Easter Vigil, and then after the Easter Vigil, there's a feast. And that is when the period of fasting ends. So it's actually an extended fast, technically several different fasts, but they're all in succession. So it's a, it's a much longer period than what you see in the West, and the fast is actually more rigorous. As I said, it includes Sundays. Now, I've been talking about fasting in connection with Lent. The question is, what does fasting mean? What, what do we mean by fasting in Lent? Because there are a lot of different ways you can fast. Um, there are many ways that are described in Scripture, and there are others that develop over time. Uh, what, we, what was traditionally done during this period is you would fast for your first two meals and only eat one meal in the evening. Now, Along with this, as time went on, this proved to be very rigorous for people who were engaged in heavy physical labor, for farmers and things like that, that, that had to have strength and energy to do their work. So in the Latin world, they added what was called a collation. This was a small meal just to give you the energy you need to get out in the morning and do your work. Uh, that was added in the 14th century, 1300s, and then in uh, 1917, uh, the Catholic Church allowed for a second collation, again, another small meal uh, during the day. Now, the idea is these two collations could not add up to more than one normal meal, and the goal was to give you strength to sustain you, but not enough food to relieve hunger. You were still supposed to feel the hunger. Um, the reason for that, by the way, goes back to Leviticus 23, where it's talking about Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, where instead of saying fasting, what it says is you afflict yourself. And so feeling the hunger when you fast is a form of afflicting yourself, and, and the Catholic Church wanted to maintain that. Now, along with the fast, there was also abstinence. And in this case, what that meant is that certain foods were forbidden. You weren't to eat meat, you weren't to eat poultry, you weren't to eat fish, you weren't to eat um, dairy, eggs. Basically, you were supposed to go on a vegan diet or something very close to it. And that your one meal a day or your collations would be 
in the form of this abstinence. It would, they, you would abstain from these foods. Along with that, by the way, you were also supposed to abstain from sexual relations during the period. Now, uh, along with the fasting, there were other devotional practices that were added, which I won't get into here, but you were supposed to engage in, um, in various kinds of special church services and things like that during the period, uh, particularly during Holy Week. Now, the rules for the fast have been relaxed, and even the abstinence have been relaxed uh, somewhat uh, within the Catholic world and certainly among Protestants. The Orthodox world tends to be much more strict on these things, though perhaps not as strict as they used to be. So that's the historic practice of Lent. What does this have to say to us today? Um, Especially if you aren't in a church that the, like the Catholic Church or the Orthodox Church that has uh, firm guidelines on what you should and should not be doing during Lent. Does Lent have any value for those of us who are Protestants? Uh, I would say that the answer is yes. And the answer is yes for several different reasons. Uh, first of all, fasting is a legitimate spiritual discipline. Uh, Jesus expected his followers to fast. Notice he says, when you fast, do it this way. He doesn't say if you fast. So Jesus expected us to fast. Now, in our society, this seems a little bit weird. Uh, Unless you're doing intermittent fasting for weight loss, self-denial is not something that we're particularly good at. We live in an overindulgent and self-indulgent society. Uh, And you'll find many people who will tell you that fasting is unhealthy. You know, it, it messes up your blood sugar, it messes up your hormones, it does whatever. It can do those things, but it normally doesn't. It's actually, particularly in a society that is as overfed, frankly, as ours is, fasting can actually be a very healthy practice, though that isn't the reason for doing it. Fasting does a lot of different things for us. It it shows what controls us. It reminds us of our weakness. It's a good tool to, for remembering for, to pray during the day. There, as you feel hunger, it reminds you, yes, I need to pray. There are a lot of reasons for fasting. And if you're interested in pursuing this further, uh, there is an article that we'll link to that I've written that talks about some of the reasons, some of the benefits for fasting, and gives you some suggestions for how to get started. It is a practice that we should be doing, and I would say we should be doing regularly. And if you're not, then Lent is a great time to get started. Along with that, I should add that if you are doing it, Lent is a good time to maybe up your game, to increase the rigor of the fast. Now, along with fasting, we have the practice of abstinence, which again is one of these things that I think we tend to underestimate its importance. Um, Abstinence really shows up most in our culture in the idea of giving up something for Lent. Usually, this is something sort of arbitrary. Oh, what are you going to give up for Lent? Oh, I think I'll I'll stop eating chocolate. You know, something like that. We don't really think about abstinence, what we're giving up, in connection with its spiritual purpose. I would suggest that the best way, if it, you know, if you're confessed, which I would encourage you to to do, unless you have medical reasons not to. There are legitimate reasons not to engage in fasting. Uh, if you're pregnant, uh, if you're hypoglycemic, there are a lot of reasons why this this just is would not be a good idea. But apart from that, I do encourage you to fast. But everybody can easily engage in forms of abstinence, forms of giving things up, surrendering things. I would suggest that there are better ways of thinking about this than just sort of coming up with something you're not going to, to be enjoying. Um, The first question you should ask when you're approaching the question of abstinence is, what is there in my life that controls me? The only person, well, the only thing that should control us is God, and we should be in control of ourselves as well. So what are are the compulsive behaviors that we engage in that maybe aren't really good for us? Um, and as an example, in my experience, I was on social media a lot dealing with uh, political issues and social issues and things like that. And I realized that this had turned into something that was a compulsion for me. And I, uh, one Lent, I gave it up and it actually broke its hold over me. So I no longer am 
you know, when I, when I finished with it, I could go back to doing it, but doing it in a much more moderate way. So what are these compulsions? What are the things that are controlling you? What are the things that, that in your life that are standing in the way of your relationship with God? Lent is a really good time to think about how to change that. Uh, what habits do you need to break? But don't just think about it in terms of the negatives. What is there positive that you need to add to your life to enhance your love of God and love of neighbor? And what do you have to give up to add that? Because we're all very, very busy. Uh, remember, during the Lenten period, it was not simply a fast, but there were additional devotional practices that were added. That's the sort of thing we're thinking about here. What good do you need to add to your life, and what do you need to give up to get there? So these are some ways to think about Lent and to use this time to connect with church history, to connect with this historic practice of Christian people around the world, but also to help you in your own spiritual formation to grow in grace, to grow in your connection with Christ, to grow in your obedience. Again, the Lenten fast is supposed to be difficult. It isn't supposed to be easy. We are to afflict ourselves, as it says in Leviticus. But it's more than just about afflicting ourselves. It's about repentance. It's about turning away from the things that are controlling us that shouldn't. It's about turning our lives not just away from the bad, but toward the good. This is what repentance is about. Repentance is not just turning away from evil, but it's turning toward good. And Lent, as a season of repentance, as a season of penance, as a season where we prepare ourselves to really think through and understand what Christ went through for us during Holy Week on the cross. Well, repentance, afflicting ourselves, things like that is in fact an appropriate way of getting ready for that. And then when Easter comes, we can have a real celebration.